happy to be here to be able to present our group's research. And of course, thank you to uh, putting together the conference. It's been fantastic being here this year. The presentations have just been, you know, just wonderful. I mean, I'm very excited to get back home so I can start re-looking at my data and see some of these trends, uh, see if I can find anything that's been talked about today. And I'm still sponging a little bit of it in right now, so hopefully if I get a little sidetracked, I don't go off on too much of a tangent, like I'm trying to connect dots through mine and the others. But uh, yeah, it, it should be should be a bit of fun. Uh, so I'm at the MRI Institute for Biomedical Research in Michigan. I work with Mark Hickey, uh, and uh, I'll just be giving updates to a bit of our imaging research, uh, specifically most focused on multiple sclerosis in a study I've been doing, uh, but also a couple of imaging techniques we've been working on. Uh, as a disclosure, I also am an employee of Magnetic Cords and Innovations. And I work with a lot of different collaborators across the globe and uh, within our own lab. So of course, I'd like to give recognition to people who have helped me uh, put together the slides today. A lot of uh, hours go into what uh, we present at these types of conferences, and uh, it's really appreciated. So as an outline, I'll be going over the uh, imaging methods we use to visualize and assess MS lesions. And then I want to go into kind of a postulation of what can we really say about MR data about the MS lesions development. And then I'll be talking about demyelination versus inflammation in images. Uh, I, this is part of the study I've been working on, and unfortunately I wasn't able to get it through the legal team in time so that I could actually uh, present most of the results. But Hopefully, uh, if I do give any results, it's uh, very brief and maybe just an expectation of what might be to come. Uh, of course, it, I think it has been approved as an abstract for an upcoming conference next year, so it might be a little bit of a wait, but we'll see how that turns out. Uh, then I'll be talking about two different imaging methods we've been working on. One, the strategically acquired gradient acro imaging, or stage imaging, and uh, of course, cerebral microblazing calcifications. And we're using two different types of images now, the P-SWIM and the MP-SWIM. So to start magnetic resonance imaging, I think everyone in the room has had an MRI before, or at least know of someone who's had an MRI. Uh, while we're sitting here right now, we're in the Earth's magnetic field, but when you're inside the pole of a magnet, you're in a field that's about 50,000 times that strength. So all of the different photons in your body align to that magnetic field. And a lot of people wonder, like, why is it so noisy? And this is actually the linear gradient which is applied across the magnet. So we want to use these different types of uh, magnetization to get imaging of the water protons. And we're able to see these in their various environmental or physical states. Uh, also, we're able to image the magnetization of different diamagnetic and paramagnetic uh, objects. Uh, of course, like different radio frequency pulses are applied to, to tip the precession of the protons, and then we allow them to reorient themselves with the field. And all of these different properties create different contrasts in the image. Uh, of course, everyone is familiar with multiple sclerosis as a neurodegenerative disease, and it's very difficult to characterize. There's a very wide range of symptoms, uh, which makes studying it and linking images to symptoms, to EDSS scores, to everything else, uh, patient reports that are qualitative, uh, you know, quantitative measurements, and then taking imaging and <laughs> correlating them can be a bit of a challenge. Uh, of course, we have uh, this uh, self-targeting response once we have blood brain barrier disruption and infiltration of peripheral macrophages. And there's a very clear and recognized uh, vascular aspect to the uh, MS lesions, the venocentric uh, lesion, as well as the vascular dysfunction and states of hypoxia within lesions. And we also see disruption and scarring of the myelin sheets of the central nervous system. When we start approaching wanting to generate a protocol to either research or evaluate a clinical image, <coughs> uh, there's many different options right now. And these are pretty much all the ones we've included in this study. Uh, the conventional imaging, of course, if you go for a routine MRI, this is typically what will be ran a pre post contrast T1 weighted image, a T2 weighted, a T2 flared, and diffusion weighted imaging. And uh, from these, uh, like my mother went the other day, uh, she wanted to get an MRI done because she was having a spinal cord stimulator put in for chronic pain. And she had to get, I think, three MRIs done in a month because they kept coming back inconclusive. So the first site to stick to these labs just did a conventional protocol. They're like, hmm, there's something, but we're not quite sure. So they sent her back again, and she got SWI at it too. Uh, susceptibility weighted imaging is uh, one of the techniques Dr. Heike has developed, and it's looking for different magnetization of the tissue. So we're able to see things like microbleeds with clarity and uh, different vascular effects in the brain. And she got this done as well. 
Well, that seemed to confuse them even more because at the new site, they just ran SWI with nothing else. So like, again, inconclusive, we can't say anything, so she had to go back for another one. And in the final scan, she just got a couple other things done, but now she has to be followed up every three months. So a lot of imaging, and maybe not as effective imaging as it could have been. Yeah. Just pull the mic a little bit closer. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, and there's, of course, diffusion tensor imaging. Uh, here we're able to reconstruct images based on the diffusion of water molecules along the uh, uh, parallel white matter tracks. So in multiple sclerosis, the wiring of your brain, the white matter, uh, becomes destroyed. So we have breaks in the myelin. And then diffusion of water isn't along those anymore. It's kind of more free-floating. Uh, so this is what we use to do that method. There's also MTR and perfusion. Uh, something called myelin water fraction, where we're looking at the bound water. So water in one of its environmental states within the myelin is myelin water. And we're able to take this as a ratio. It should be right around somewhere maybe 0.3 for normal appearing white matter. And in lesions, this can drop 10, 20 percent. And I'll be going over stage imaging uh, a little bit later on in the presentation. So when we look at something like a T2 flare image, we have these, uh, I think you'll remember this from Dr. Colt's presentation. Uh, I found that very interesting. Did you notice in the image that the lesions that kind of exploded like fireworks over the year, they appeared, they were there, and then they disappeared quite quickly, right? Uh, but if you looked carefully at the image, there was actually also paraventricular lesions that remained static. So there's a difference between the types of tissue. It might be, oh, they're all bright, they all might be the same. No, there's actually quite a complex variety of lesions. So typically when a lesion just remains chronic and stable, it's most likely the result of scarring. So this is just scar tissue. When we have a very acute lesion that appears very brightly and then disappears, this is likely an acute inflammation response. Uh, what we really want to see is whether or not we can tell the difference between water content changes and changes in iron. So uh, a lot of people use just T2-weighted imaging to do MS lesions. But a problem with that is that there's two competing forces, so the water content and then the iron. Uh, a recent study came out and said that uh, T2 and possibly changes in T1 actually reflect the oxidative stress. Uh, there's been some correlations with studies uh, looking at T2 hypointensities in the gray matter, so not really the white matter, but more like the gray matter. Uh, these type of intensities were related to the physical disability, cognitive dysfunction, and brain atrophy. And they actually might be caused by increased brain iron content. So one of the methods we use to do brain iron content is susceptibility weighted imaging. This is a 3D gradient echo technique. And if you're going to look at one of the images, what you'll see is mostly the deoxyhemoglobin in veins, which acts as an intrinsic contrast agent. We'll have cerebral microbleeds or venous thrombosis, which are pretty common. In AD, uh, multiple sclerosis, stroke, and TBI. Uh, more recently, we looked at uh, MS cohorts and published a couple papers on this. Uh, we did see that there was an increase in prevalence of uh, cerebral microbleeding in MS patients, but this is mostly related to cardiovascular risk factors, which was very interesting that they were covered so thoroughly earlier on. We also can see the iron deposition in the basal ganglia and midbrain. And of course, we are going to be looking for the susceptibility changes which can be seen in MS lesions. And these would be regions of demyelination. Uh, the myelin sheets of the brain, as you can see, comparing that earlier T2 images to the uh, SWI filtered phase. So the phase image is reflecting different magnetizations. And you can see the uh, white matter of the brain is a little bit brighter than the gray matter. The gray matter appears as these dark folds at the edge of the brain. And then also the yellow arrows are pointing to MS lesions, which have become a little bit darker. So the diamagnetic property of uh, myelin uh, creates a little bit of a brightness in the uh, phase image, and then the MS lesion is now dark because that myelin has been removed. Uh, another interesting note is that you can actually see the central vein in this image. So looking at other work, uh, this is now looking at non-enhancing lesions. Uh, they appear larger with hypo-intense room on QSM than a T2-weighted whereas the enhancing lesions appear iso-intense on QSM. So if you look at the green arrow, this is pointing at an enhancing T1 contrast. So gadolinium is a T1 shortener. It creates a bright image when there's acute blood-brain barrier disruption. And when we had this, there was no effect in QSM. So when there's acute blood-brain barrier disruption, we likely have an inflammatory response. But yeah, we don't have demyelination yet. 
we look at more chronic lesions that are not enhancing that have likely been there for a while, now we've actually had uh, active demyelination. So how important is it that we can see inflammatory responses? These typically don't reflect the patient's scores. So when we were hearing about the patient earlier who had these bright fireworks going off in T2, but they didn't have any change in their symptoms, uh, it just made me think, well, the white matter is left intact. They had an acute inflammatory response, and that's maintained and put under control again, either by their uh, you know, treatment. Uh, so this way they can prevent it from becoming a more chronic acute, uh, a, a chronic uh, demyelinated. So this is what we're trying to do here. It's uh, determining whether or not we're having inflammatory lesion, demyelinating lesion, or both processes are, are occurring simultaneously. So if we were able to do this, potentially we would say, these are the more important lesions that we have to look at. These are the key imaging biomarker and endpoint that we have to follow so that we can give the best predictor for how a patient will respond to a treatment, a drug, a lifestyle change. So we already know that the myelin sheath of white matter becomes degraded with disease progression. Uh, I've already said the diamagnetic nature of myelin. Uh, but what we're seeing in the image uh, that gives that contrast is only a change of about 50 to 60 parts per billion of susceptibility units. So this is just enough for us to be able to quantify it and then compare it longitudinally through time. So combining these two elements I think could be the most powerful clinical imaging technique. So taking the flare image, which is very sensitive to very robust spread of lesion types. Uh, it could be from edema, uh, inflammation, uh, scar tissue. Uh, whereas the phase image uh, is showing the areas where we have macrophages that are iron laden once they come in and start digesting the uh, white matter sheath, as well as the uh, demyelination. So I was going through cases to review them for the presentation, and I came across this one, which I found very interesting, because uh, you can see above the orange arrow is pointing to a region where we have a T2 increase in signals, so we have an inflammatory response. We also have in the FA, a uh, reduction of signal, which would indicate that the white matter parallel nature has been removed, it's broken, so the water is just diffusing everywhere in the brain. And then we also have a region of increased contrast uh, in SWI phase. So likely what's happening here is we have a vast lesion of demyelination, inflammatory response, and destruction of the myelin sheaths. Below that, we have a very focal central flare lesion. However, outside of that, we have the phase rim extending. So I thought, mm, potentially this could be a different characterization of that lesion. So are we seeing a predictive quality of QSM to be able to say, okay, this is where the next attack will occur. This is where the tissue is becoming degraded the fastest. Uh, this is something we have to pay closer attention to, characterizing lesions and then correlating them with the patient's symptom. Uh, now saying that, uh, because there's such a wide diversity of MS lesion types and imaging modalities, uh, there's confliction in literature. Of course, people find different findings. Uh, one study noted a lack of the change in the lesions. Uh, another one actually found that they're more smoldering around the edges. The lesions appear to become darker and more hypo-intense as time goes on. Uh, it's interesting, I think. Uh, when we look at what these actually do in a mouse model, these regions actually match hypoxia, inflammation, iron deposition, and demyelination. So it's exactly what we're expecting to come out of it. Uh, another issue, uh, more recently it, uh, brought up, is that uh, acute versus chronic lesions. Uh, what we know is happening is there's a blood-brain barrier, uh, breakage, uh, and then potentially we might see an increase in CBD or a different flow property. The most traditional method is just to inject, inject uh, gadolinium. Uh, this has become potentially a little more distressing recently because of gadolinium retention in the brain, so people have been turned off to this. Uh, what we aim to do is uh, look to see whether or not there's any other metrics in the image to prevent you know, nervousness about this. One of them was the perfusion maps. So we can see that in an acute lesion, it has relatively higher CBV than the chronic lesions that are non-enhancing. And there has been another interesting paper that come out recently that shows that QSM may also have a predictive quality for lesions that will become enhancing. 
So T2 star images show both focal and intracortical and leukocortical lesions suggest that perhaps both myelin and iron loss occur. Early lesion inflammatory responses can be seen with T2 star, while QSM changes were not observed until the chronic phase. So that's just basically saying that we see this inflammatory response and then we see the demyelination afterwards. This would uh, indicate uh, from the paper that there is actually uh, increased quality in the QSM. Uh, in phase images, typically people report this ring-type lesion in all of their lesions. All the lesions have a ring instead of being the solid mass of demyelination. And this actually might just be because uh, the source phase is behaving as it should. In magnetization, they create dipole effects. In QSM, these dipole effects are then reconstructed to be the original source phase. So, it, As the myelin is digested, this is another paper that supports those. Uh, we see that in the enhancement phase, where there's an acute blood barrier, barrier disruption, we don't have any uh, corresponding QSM value change. Whereas once the lesion has become chronic, it's no longer this uh, acute uh, blood barrier, barrier disruption. Now we had infiltration of macrophages, which are now digesting the white matter. And that's after the fact. The idea is that the damage occurs and they're, they're not the first responders. <clears throat> so the inflammation first and then demyelination. However, there's conflicting reports about that as well in literature. Some people say that the QSM susceptibility change occurs before the inflammatory response. So whether or not this is an effect of patient uh, medication mitigation or... Well, in the common trigger pathway for both problems, inflammation and myelination loss mm. is hypoxia. Yes. Because the oligodendrocytes that make the myelin are exquisitely sensitive to low oxygen and they die. Mm. So what we would like to propose is that uh, if uh, protocol is generated that both SWI and flare are included, so that way we can uh, measure quantify the rates of inflammatory response as well as the demyelinating response. And of course, that was a, a mouthful to go over all the this different modalities and a lot to understand. Um, even I don't understand a lot of the more complex imaging techniques. This is the, you know, the very high level physics. And, uh, uh, if one were to run all of these acquisitions, it takes about uh, 90 minutes, so it's very difficult to get patients uh, in throughput when you have 90 minute scan time. So Dr. Hickey has had the foresight to do this, and he's introducing the stage imaging protocol, a strategically acquired gradient echo, and it uh, sums up most of the images that were found in that 90 minute protocol and makes it into about a uh, five minute protocol. So it's a huge saving time, huge, more robust quality of data that could be available from the images. And when combined with T2, Flare, and DWI, everything is collected in less than 10 minutes. So to look at the quality of those images, here we have a spin density, a T1 weighted, and then an enhanced T1 image. Uh, you can see that the images have just the same quality, good contrast between gray matter and white matter in CSF. And, uh, could potentially be very, very valuable for measuring MS lesions. We see all the other images combined. Uh, we also have different quantitative maps, the T1 map, the PD map. Uh, we have uh, synthetic MR with the dual inversion recovery, which can assist in MS lesion segmentation automatically and deep gray matter segmentation. Uh, we also have quantitative susceptibility mapping. And when combined, if we do DWI with an ADC map, a T2 flare, and a 3D T2 flare, this could be the most robust method for imaging different neurovascular and neurodegenerative diseases. Is that five minutes? Yes. So the stage one protocol is five minutes. Stage A. We look at stage B. Now this is a Another method, it's going to be using an interleaved sequence. Uh, this allows us to visualize both the arteries and the veins, so we're able to get MRA information and MRV information. Uh, you can see in the bottom, uh, bottom left, these images are from the first acquisition. 
If we're able to add in the extra five minutes, then we're able to get these images, the vascular maps, uh, RT star map, uh, IMRA, and enhanced MRA, which is basically a fusion of MRA, the angiogram, and the venogram. And we can see different major territories. In this case, has a stroke in the middle cerebral artery. And this has kind of been the focus of my work recently, looking at CNVs and stroke. I only show this so that way you can see that there's a overarching theme of how CNVs appear across different diseases. Uh, they should be sphere or ovoid in shape. They should have high susceptibility and high R2 star. There should be a lack of connectivity to veins. And there should be sufficient phasing, even at low flip angles, uh, short echo data, that we're able to see them. Uh, using these properties, we have actually had a couple different approaches that we're working on. Uh, one of which is using uh, thresholding across the images so we can automatically locate these microbleeds and uh, spit out a report for radiologists to look at and confirm. Another one is using machine learning or artificial intelligence, feeding in the different true positive microbleeds and allowing it to scan the images. And it does this much faster than I do, even. I was a bit insulted the other day. Uh, and. Uh, Hopefully one of these methods will pan out, and of course we'll be presenting those at conferences as well. So a uh, little case study uh, to look at a mild cognitive impairment patient. If they were to just get an SWI scan or a gradient echo scan, this would be very concerning. You think having a bit of brain fog, a little mild cognitive impairment, you go in and all of a sudden you see very large objects in the brain that look like Hemorrhages. So typically this is the time where we say, okay, it's time to go sailing, dementia might be setting in, just enjoy it. Uh, <laughs> 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 so, uh, we look at the phase image, however, uh, this patient actually has more of a diamagnetic property to it. So this is a P-swim image. This is a mint maximum intensity projection through the phase images. The phase images can be quite messy to look at and interpret. Uh, it's very difficult. A lot of times before they would just uh, throw them out. It was a requirement to have to look at them. You actually have to have a special research key on some magnets to be able to save these images. Uh, I don't know if they don't want you to look at them, but it, it's kind of funny. Uh, because uh, if you look at the center of the Smith phase, it does have some funny behavior. So it's not a, a very clean signal going across it. So I would say it's likely behaving like a diamagnetic source. We look at QSM. QSM can be difficult to reconstruct. It's a great method, but it's very complicated in some cases. Everybody has a different method. When I say QSM, some people will do a very simple version of it. Others have much more complex. Uh, one of the pitfalls is that uh, it does a brain erosion technique. And if there's aliasing within that structure that you're trying to identify, the end result, especially across the MIT, can look like this. So if this was purely dark, I would say, okay, this is a very clear calcification, not a hemorrhage. But in the projection, I see there's just a bright point in the very center of it. This made me think, oh, okay, could it be a calcium plus iron lesion? There could be a source of mineralization, and then within that mineralization, all of a sudden we have bleeding occurring as well. So that would be very concerning. We look at something like the MP swim. This actually confirms that this is a calcification. So this is basically scanning through the object and then doing a projection based on the surrounding intensities. And the reason why this is so important is that, I mean, in the end, a straightforward process will lead to the same conclusion as a complicated one. So we can do this very quickly. It doesn't require all of these extra things to get this and that image. And it helps this patient know that they have a different disorder, a mineralization disorder, instead of you know, large-scale hemorrhages occurring across the brain. So the main pitfall it's avoiding is that erosion, the brain extraction erosion. So we're actually preserving more information there than uh, if we were to do a TSM map with this MP swim. Uh, it's removing a lot of the undulations or funniness within the image. And uh, of course, it, it avoids the pitfall that aliasing can, can uh, bring forward. Okay. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, do we have any questions from the audience? Okay, so. David, um, the very first thing I was told is lesions don't matter. You know, and I think it was a way to say, don't 
don't worry about all these spots that I found on your brain. But is that, and you've shown us that they matter in terms of being able to keep the patient informed and, I think, and, and to keep the research informed so science can move forward. I think mean, that's really important. However, does that location of the lesion correlate to disability or disease manifestation? There's conflicting uh, report in the literature. I think a lot of people say no. And then I've actually been told before when I was quantifying T2 flare lesions that that's too much work, so don't do it. <laughs> uh, it like why would anyone actually characterize every single lesion we see in the brain and then try and find a correlation with the disease with such a wide spectrum of uh, symptoms. Um, I think that there's importance to it, and I think that characterizing the lesion appearance and a better understanding of why the lesion appears like that is necessary. So this is really what we're pushing for, to better be able to understand that for each individual lesion, regardless of where it is in the brain, what is happening in that particular lesion. Is it just inflammation, or is there really a change in the tissue property itself, like the structure? Well, wouldn't it make sense that it would be causing some kind of problem with whatever area it's landing on, and whether it be the, the mobility or verbal or whatever? That if it's a, like lesion, is, or I've been known that thought it would be scar tissue, wouldn't that be like a, a blockage, like a sort of prevents the blood flow from getting where it needs to go, or the oxygen? Or we have to remember there's also redundancy in the brain as well. So typically the way things are wired, when we're looking at something in the central white matter, this region is probably having wiring from a large uh, region transmitting data back from the cortical tissue to the deep gray matter to the body's periphery. So this can be quite difficult unless you have a perfect image that gives you every single tract of white matter in the brain. I think then maybe you could pinpoint, okay, this is the area that would likely be affected. And that's where the DTI guys could really help us out, is to get to the best tractography possible, to know if this lesion is here, where is it impacting? And then does the body actually respond well to that uh, if, uh, if the lesion goes away? Can these, all of your different MRIs that you're talking about, can they be done with our current MRI machines? Sure, yeah. Okay, I just wanted to see if we needed another, an upgrade or whatever. Uh, you're running out of a hospital? Uh, I'm not, personally, but yes, we have a <laughs> okay. yep. hospital MRI, yeah. Uh, I think we've tried, um, at least for the stage protocol mm -hmm. on 1.5T magnets, uh, both GE and Siemens. Uh, Siemens, I think it's a little bit easier for us to work with, but we have got it working on GE magnets as well, and Philips. Uh, so regardless of the 1.5T or 3T field strength, we can get it running. Okay. How many of those are done in Canada right now? Yeah. I'm sorry, I've mostly been working in China lately. Uh, <laughs> so, yes. the, the so we have zero so far doing that method. As good as it is. Hmm. I would suggest. <laughs> so we have the technology, but we are not using it. Yeah. And we could use it without extending the time in the MRI. Yeah. Yeah. But we have the people primarily in control of the <clears throat> technology yeah. ordering the test. All of this, not accepting that there's a vascular issue, a blood vessel issue, so they won't do those things that show us that part. Mm -hmm. They could do it for virtually no extra cost. I was wondering what effect hereditary disease has on the Or a heart disease. Yeah. And now all my uncles at my mom's side had heart disease as 
well in my heart disease. I likely have heart disease, but uh, I, I try and take care of myself as much as possible. Um, but uh, the imaging aspect of things, I think, is uh, very individual based. I think understanding the genetic background of someone it, it could be very valuable in understanding disease progression. Uh, and other cardiovascular risk factors and predisposition. Uh, uh, yeah, it, it can be difficult. I mean, that would be an interesting study. It is difficult to develop a family tree. Mm. That's, what, <laughs> that's what the person, my brother, who's got the determine whether it's an early stage, which would be in the inflammation process, or a late stage, which is demyelination, and then that would correspond to giving the person the appropriate treatment for the stage that they're at? Not yet. However, it could be very valuable for clinical trials or looking at different uh, disease-modifying behavior or uh, treatments. Um, I think that better understanding how lesions react rather than just saying, okay, they're there, they're gone. You know, a lot of people have no lesions, they feel terrible. You know, I mean, maybe one of the other imaging modalities that wasn't collected will actually show that they do have some underlying problem in the brain. Um, uh, the stage imaging, uh, I think, is attempting to give us the most bang for the buck. If every patient were able to get a two-hour scan, I think we would have so much information to look at we might be able to better understand a lot of different things. So what we're trying to do is make it actually <coughs> economically feasible to collect that amount of information in a quicker amount of time. Uh, so from our findings, uh, I can't really go into them too much, uh, but from all that acquisition, we find that there's a lot of redundancy with the research protocols that people are running. Uh, so what we would recommend is that stage protocol with the flare and diffusion. So David, if I understand correctly, so someone could be in the MRI machine for five minutes instead of 90 minutes, yeah. and we'd be done? Yeah. So, there's a summary for you. So I don't know, I don't, how many people have been in MRI and how many people kind of get anxious about that, right? And so I'd rather be in there for five minutes. Anyway, David, thank you so much for coming all the way from Michigan to have us today.